But beginning in verse 27 and reading to verse 28, Matthew chapter 16, Matthew writes, For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste the death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So let's do a review so we can lead up to this portion of Scripture. I'm going to spend a lot of time in verse 27, and then I'll move from verse 28, give a few introductory comments, and move into chapter 17. With that said, Jesus has just stated, as we've been going through chapter 16, that he would go to Jerusalem, that he would suffer, that he would die, and that he would be resurrected. You saw that in chapter 16, verse 21. Now, all of this that he's saying at that time is something that his men couldn't grasp, especially when he began to speak concerning his resurrection. Now, you need to remember that during this day, the doctrine of the resurrection was yet to be fully explained. They really didn't understand what Jesus was speaking about when he spoke of resurrection. When you look in the Old Testament, the oldest book of the Bible is the book of Job. The book of Job was written some 600 years before Moses penned the book of Genesis. And so it's commonly known that Job is the oldest written book of the Bible. So all the way back 1,400 years, um, two, uh, yeah, no, 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 no. Over, over 1,400 years prior to, um, oh, I'm gonna slow down and begin again. 2,000 years before Christ. Moses being 1,400 years before Christ, so 2,000 years before Christ with Job, Job being uh, alive during the time of Abraham, Job wrote and Job gave insight into an event that we now know as resurrection. And so the doctrine of resurrection actually predates the writing of the book of Genesis, and so when you have Job speaking concerning resurrection, you'll see that this is a doctrine that had already been spoken of but not yet developed. You see, in Job 19, verses 25 through 27, Job said, I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth, and after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. So Job writing before, uh, you know, 2,000 years before Christ or so, had made it very clear that there was an event that would take place that he was looking forward to, and that would be resurrection. Later on in the writings of David, the psalmist of Israel, David living around 1,000 years before Christ, later on in one of his psalms, Psalm 17, King David said in verse 15, As for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. And so we have Job 2,000 years before Christ alluding to resurrection. You see David 1,000 years before Christ speaking about awakening in God's likeness. Then you have Daniel. Daniel wrote some 605 before Christ. And in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, Daniel said, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And so 2,000 years, 1,000 years, 605, all of these years before Christ, the, the teaching or the doctrine of resurrection, the revelation of resurrection had already begun to take place. It was alluded to in the Old Testament, but not fully explained at that time. So Jesus was speaking concerning his resurrection to his men, but they were unable to grasp it. You're going to see that that's a little more explained in the transfiguration story that we'll soon examine. So as we take that into consideration, the events leading to Jesus' resurrection were unthinkable to them, especially when he began to say that he would suffer and that he would die. And so that was revealed by the response of the apostle Peter when he said, far be that from you, that these things should occur to you. He actually brought a rebuke, if you will, under satanic inspiration. And he wanted to preserve Jesus' honor by rebuking him. He was attempting to protect Jesus by dissuading him from suffering and dying. But remember with me in verse 23 that Jesus' response was immediate. He said, get behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me. So what he did there is, is, as I showed you last time, 
is he rebuked Peter for acting as Satan's mouthpiece. Jesus had to go to the way of the cross. There was no other way to obtain salvation. Salvation was to be the result of Jesus dying as a voluntary sacrifice on our behalf. He says in Mark 10, 45, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6 said that Jesus gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. The word ransom speaks of paying a price to set a captive free from sin, iniquity, bondage, or lawlessness. And the word ransom speaks of the, of the price that was blood, the blood of Christ. So Jesus speaks concerning this, and, and then he goes on and speaks concerning the cost of discipleship and, and made it very clear that the way of a follower of Christ invo it will involve difficulty and self-sacrifice. It includes self-denial. And as he's been speaking concerning that, he now moves on in verse 27, and he says, For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. And now he begins to speak concerning his return. This is the first specific revelation of his second coming. He says he's going to come in the glory of the Father. And what we have here is we have the glory of the Father that is revealed by him being the Son of God. But he also is going to come in his own kingdom that he receives as the Son of Man. Now this return of Christ is something that every believer should be thrilled about. His return is intended to provoke us to faithful, sustained, joyful anticipation as we await Him. The fact that Christ has promised to return ought to cause every genuine believer to be fully excited and anticipating His soon return. It's something that should motivate every person who really loves him to live an, in an expectation, in an anticipation. It ought to provoke us to live in such a way that when he returns, we are prepared for him. When you look at uh, Jude in verse 21 in the New Testament, the writer Jude said, Keep yourself in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. And so keep yourself in the love of God. Keep walking in the things of the Spirit. Keep loving His Word. Keep serving Him. Keep sharing about Him. And just keep waiting for Him. Now, as the Lord has been speaking, this time of teaching must have been emotionally draining, but it was also challenging for them because He's revealing many things to them that are difficult to grasp. He had spoken to them about being God in human flesh. He had informed them that he was establishing the invincible church. He revealed that he would suffer at the hands of the Sanhedrin, that he would die, be resurrected. And then, after saying all of this, he went on to tell them that he will return to planet Earth. And that is just too much to grasp. And yet he says in verse 27, The Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father and his angels. What an amazing thing for somebody to say to you that I'm going to return, I'm going to be tried, I'm going to die, I'm going to be buried, I'm going to be resurrected, but don't worry about it, I'm going to return. I mean, you know, it has been said either he was a, a liar or he was a lunatic or he's the Lord. There's just no way that, that Jesus could make those kinds of statements and still be trusted if they weren't true. And he's speaking about that. He's saying, I am going to return with the, in the glory of my Father and his angels. He will no longer be veiled, in other words, by human flesh. He will reveal his glory. Later on in John 17, verse 24, Jesus was praying, and he said, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. I want them to see my glory is what he prayed. I want them to see that kind of glory, which is what will be revealed when he comes with, uh, with the, uh, the angels. And so Jesus will later on elaborate more fully about this and will give more details. When we get to Matthew chapter 20, 24 uh, in about two years, when we get there, 
It says in verses 29 through 31, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. They shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So he says, I will return in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So as Christians, we look forward to seeing him. And here's something for you. We remain openly identified with him. I wonder how many of you had opportunity to watch any of the Olympics any of you watch it at all, or am I the only person who did? I was blessed when a couple of divers made a comment when they said, our identity is not in a gold medal or a silver medal. They said this with a billion people watching. They said, our identity is in Jesus Christ. And I said, yes, that is better than any silver or gold or bronze. That's so much better than that. Just to hear them say that, it spoke to my heart. And it said, oh, thank you, Lord, for, for people who are willing to be open witnesses in front of so many people. Thank you, Lord, that they were able to give a little bit of, a, of an insight into what it means to actually know what it is to be a Christian. Or even after our girls won the four by four by 400 um, uh, relay, and they all put their arms around each other and they said a prayer, you know, and they did that with the four by 100. And, and I watched a lot of the track and, and all because I enjoy track and, and field. And, and it, just to see them giving honor to the Lord, what a blessing it is. Don't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't be ashamed of standing up and saying, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, he's not ashamed of you. Why should you be ashamed of him? You know, he died on a cross openly for me. Why wouldn't I be open about my faith in him? And there are people who say, oh, you shove your faith down people's throats, you know. Well, the fact is, is the world shoves its faith down my throat 24-7. I was on a, I, I've said this before, I was on a train, I was in England, and, and, and I sat next to some, uh, an American from the East Coast, and and Marie and I were together, we were doing ministry in London. And while I was there, happened to get on a train, we were going into London, and this American was real friendly, was seated next to me and, and visiting with me and, and a, a woman, a young woman. And as we were speaking, she, she said, she, I said, what are you doing in England? And she says, oh, and she's telling me she's on a tour and this and that. And she just starts telling me her story. She says, oh, I sing dirty bar songs. That's what I do for a living. That's what she told me. I, I sing dirty. It's, the word she used was body, B-A-W-D-Y, body, in dirty songs. And, and I'm just sitting there. I'm not saying a word, you know. I don't want her to sing any to me. <laughs> but she's singing, you know. She's telling me that's what she does. She goes, I go to bars and I sing nasty songs. I didn't say a word, and she just goes on. She's from Massachusetts, and she's telling me her story and how she got there. I mean, it took several minutes, and I'm just, I'm just politely listening and smiling at her, you know, whatever, and, and then she says, and what do you do? <laughs> I, 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 said, uh, I said, I'm a pastor. She looks at me, and this is... The truth, she looks at me, she says, I don't like people shoving their faith down my throat. I hadn't said a word. I hadn't said a word. I just, I, I just been listening to her. I hadn't said a thing. You know, she was too busy singing her dirty songs. I don't know, I was, I'm just, I didn't say a word. And I, and I said, excuse me? She goes, I don't like it when Christians shove their, 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 their message down my throat. And I smiled at her and I said, but it's okay for you to shove yours down mine. And she goes, I haven't shoved, and I said, oh. She goes, when does my message get shoved down your throat? I said, every time I turn on a TV, every time I go to the store and there's a magazine or a newspaper article, every time I turn on a radio or I look at a billboard, your message is shoved down my throat every moment of the day. 
your message is shoved down my throat. And I find it interesting that you think that because I said I'm a pastor that I'm shoving my message down your throat. No, your message is 24-7 on every channel. I've asked the question before of the church, who is the greatest evangelist? And uh, name them, two or three. Name, and, and, and our church on occasion, you know, will say, uh, Billy Graham, you know, Luis Palau, you know, Greg Laurie, you know, great evangelists, every one of them. And I'll say, they are not the greatest evangelists. And then people, well, who, who is? Now they're wanting to go into history, you know, Billy Sunday or whatever, Mordecai Ham, you know, different, Charles Spurgeon's, D.L. Moody's. They begin to think, well, who could possibly have been the great? And I'll say, NBC, CBS, ABC. That is the greatest evangelistic television programs you will see. Because 24-7, that message is shoved down your throat. 24-7. And so, the bottom line is, is we need to just realize, do not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the Lord can use you to reach people who will not hear this message any other way. And so, no, don't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power of God into salvation to anyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Just remain faithful to that and, and share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, we look forward to being with Him. We look forward to spending uh, eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's like a bride awaiting the bridegroom. And Jesus said in Mark chapter 8, verse 38, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. I don't want to be shrinking back. The word ashamed means to shrink back. I don't want to be somebody who shrinks back from the testimony of Christ. So you see, we love him. And our anticipation of being with him provokes us to a variety of things, including perseverance. You see, when you hold fast to Him, when you abide in Him, the sense of, I want to be with Him, the longing to remain faithful to Him, we actually have a, a sense of security in Christ that is produced. It's like what it says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, where John said, Now, dear children, continue in Him, so that when He appears, we may be confident and unashamed before Him at His coming. So when we truly anticipate his return, something happens in the way that we live. Paul said in Titus 2, verses 11 through 14, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. If I really, really believe that Jesus is returning, how then should I be living? Well, Paul would say in anticipation expectation. He could come at any moment, and thus we ought to be prepared at any moment. In 1 John, in chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, John said it like this. John said, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. He goes on to say, Everyone who has this hope in him, purifies himself just as he is pure. If you believe that the Lord is returning, how then should you live? You should live even as if he's at the door. My dad and mom went on vacation, left me. My brother was in the service, and my two sisters were young, so they went with mom and dad on vacation. I was left alone in the house. I was about 19. They drove out on a Saturday or so, Saturday I think it was. Monday I began having a party. Had a two-day party. 
didn't stop. I had friends who dropped wine on their brand new rug, and it was just, it was just like, it was, I don't even, we, we were really crazy kids. And so, I went, it was into the second or third, I can't remember anymore, it's been so long, but I do remember, it may have been into the third day, um, when I was in the, in the kitchen at my parents' house, and we'd been drinking and all without glorifying it, that's what we were doing. When the door in the, in, in, uh, the back door opens up, and my sister Madeline comes running into the house, I wasn't expecting to see her. They were supposed to be gone for another couple days. She comes running in and she says, Dad is mad. I can imagine why. So I had a friend of mine named Al, and some of you are too young to understand this, and that's a good thing, I'd say. But there was a drug that used to be taken. For him, the drug of choice was reds. Reds were downers. So if you took several reds, you would walk around just all like that. And that was his drug of choice. He used to drop a lot of downers, reds. And so he was really loopy, and, and he was there at the kitchen table with me, and he was so wiped out. So I got everybody, and I shoved them out the front door because my parents were coming in the back door. And I had them out. I said, get out, get out, get out as fast as you can. So I took Al, because Al was just all wasted, and I picked him off the, off the chair, and I directed him to the door, and I threw him out. <laughs> 20 seconds later, he came in the back door. <laughs> threw him out a second time, and then my dad comes in. Listen, I know the difference between anticipating with joy <laughs> and when someone comes unexpectedly. And the Lord used that in my life a long time ago. He said to me, how do you want to see my return? And you're doing right when you're doing well. You want someone to catch you doing good. You want someone to walk in and say, well done. Oh, man. But when you're not doing well, and they catch you at that, it's a different thing entirely. So how am I living? Am I living in anticipation for the return of Christ so that when he comes at any moment, I can be ready? Now, does that mean that every moment of the day, 24-7, every day of the week, every day of the month, every day of the year, that I'm just Mr. Holy, Mr. Saint? No, I'm aware of my own weaknesses. And no, I don't want you to think in any way, shape, or form that I'm saying, I'm just, you know, when I'm not here, I'm reading the Bible until I fall asleep. No, I already confessed to watching the Olympics. <laughs> what I am saying is you live in anticipation and you refrain from anything that is going to make you not prepared. And by reading the Word of God, you discover what those things are, those things that would show that you're not prepared. You see, for the believer, his appearing is a time of joy. But for the unbeliever, it will be a time of judgment. Again, notice it says in verse 27, the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So he will reward each according to his works. Now, in Romans chapter 2, verses 6 and 8, it says God will give to each person according to what he's done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. So the Christian receives a reward. But the reward is not salvation. You see, salvation is not a reward. Salvation is a gift. See, there are those who believe that you earn your salvation, but that makes salvation a work. You don't receive salvation as a work. You receive salvation as the gift of God. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, It is by grace that you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So you do not earn salvation. Salvation is given to you as a gift. 
Somebody said the cardinal error against which the gospel of Christ has to contend is the effect of the tendency of the human heart to rely on salvation by works. The great antagonist to the truth, as it is in Jesus, is the pride of man, which leads him to believe that he can be, at least in part, his own Savior. No, we are lost entirely in sin. It is the grace of God that makes it possible for us to be saved, and we're saved through faith. And so, we don't receive salvation as a reward, but we do perform good deeds. And the reason we perform good deeds or good works is because we are saved, and God graciously rewards us for doing these good works. Now, the one who has rejected Jesus cannot perform any good works. You know, a lot of times people say, but they're such a good person. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's only been one truly good person on the face of the earth, and they crucified him. That was Jesus. The rest of us are sinners in need of a Savior. That's what the Bible teaches. An early church father said this. He said, good works, as they are called in sinners, are nothing but splendid sins. And there's truth to that. So the one who rejects Jesus ultimately receives judgment. And in 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 6 through 8, Paul said, God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And so he says in verse 27, he will reward each according to his works. You see, in the final judgment, Jesus rewards them by denying them entrance into his kingdom. Remember when we were in Matthew 7, how that Jesus in verse 23 was speaking to those who professed to know him, and he said to them, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And so those who have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ receive judgment and punishment. Those who receive by grace and through faith the gift of eternal life receive a reward because they will serve him until they come to see him. And so he goes on and says in verse 28, Assuredly I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. What is he referring to when he says that? The Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Well, the word kingdom there, begin with that. The word kingdom in the original language, the, the original language here is, is Greek, is, uh, is the word basileia. The word basileia speaks of royal splendor, royal splendor, as well as a kingdom. But the word basileia can mean royal splendor, and therefore Jesus would be speaking about coming in royal splendor. To understand this, you need to cross-reference with Luke and Mark, who give to us insight into the same discussion here. And when you look at Luke chapter 9, verse 27, Luke records that Jesus said, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. In Mark chapter 9, verse 1, Mark says, He said to them, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. Royal splendor. Now, Jesus had just said, some of you will not taste death till you see the kingdom of God. So he would be speaking of an event that is about to take place that is referred to as the transfiguration. You see, he didn't return in their lifetime. So that helps us to understand he was referring to something else. And that's why you would see him move into chapter 17 and speak of the transfiguration. So in verse 1, chapter 17, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, brought them up on a high mountain by themselves, and was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, his clothes became white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here, if you wish. Let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, 
and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, shut up, Peter. No. <laughs> saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, do not be afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Now as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. His disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Jesus answered and said to them, Elijah truly is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already. And they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is, about, is also about to suffer at their hands. The disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John. Why did he take them? Well, one, we know that as we go through the Bible that Jesus often spent time with these men. They're called his inner circle. And there are times that we see him spending personal time with these men. Um, we saw them with Jesus with, when Jesus raised up Jairus' daughter. You're going to see them with him again mentioned in this way on the uh, Mount of Olives. And you'll also see them mentioned in this fashion in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so these are men that were often with him when he did certain things. But the question has to be asked, why would he take these men with him at this time? Well, because these men are going to provide eyewitness testimony. In the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy 19, verse 15, uh, the Old Testament law says a matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And so these men are going to be eyewitnesses of the event that is about to take place. And so he takes them on a high mountain by themselves. Verse 2 says, and was transfigured before them. That word transfigured speaks of being changed. It's the word that we get the word metamorphosis from. It speaks of changing into another form or being transformed. And so the divine majesty of Jesus Christ is shining through his human nature. And even his clothing is glistening with purity, somebody said. And as this is taking place, as he is being transfigured before them, and this glory begins to be revealed, the glory that he had already mentioned, by the way, uh, about... Uh, how, how, in verse 27, the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father. This glory, a prefigurement of the glory uh, that ultimately takes place. As they're seeing this take place, there's Moses and there's Elijah. And Moses and Elijah are there talking to him. Now, why Moses and why Elijah? Well, Moses in the Old Testament is referred to as the lawgiver. Ezra, chapter 7, verse 6 it says that Ezra came up from Babylon. He was a teacher, well-versed in the law of Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. So Moses is known as the law giver. Now, Elijah is also known as the defender of the law, as well as being an uncompromising prophet of Israel. So this represents the law and the prophets. The law being Moses, the prophets being Elijah. So they sum up the law and the prophets in Jesus Christ. And they're talking to him according to verse 3. Now Luke 9.31 says they spoke of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. So they're confirming what Jesus had been saying to his disciples about his death. So as this is taking place, verse 4, Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Let us make three tents. You can stay here, and we can remain here in this mountaintop experience. And uh, if you do so, then you don't have to go down, and you don't have to die. And once again, the apostle Peter begins to fill the silence with the sound of his own voice. You know, sometimes the wisest thing to do is to simply remain quiet. In Proverbs 17, 28, it says, Even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace. When he shuts his lips, he is considered perceptive. It's true. You know, if you're ever in a situation where 
there's a lot of argumentation going on and people are trying to make their point and, and you sit there quietly and you don't respond, they talk themselves out eventually. And then they'll look at you and they'll say, well, what do you say? And then at that point, you can say, I want a pizza. Or you can, you can, you can say whatever's on your mind. You know, I go to a lot of meetings and, and I'm, I'm always the one who doesn't say anything. I'm always the one who just kind of listens to everything. And it gives you an opportunity to hear every side. And then it gives you an opportunity to condense that and produce perhaps a solution. And so it's just wise to remain quiet. And sometimes, well, we need to do that. Peter should learn that. And I'll show you this in just a moment. You see, Moses and Elijah had to leave because Jesus would remain preeminent when they left. And so as I looked at this, I, I, I came up with at least three basic things that I could learn that will help me in my walk with God. Now one, I want you to notice this, when he says in verse four, let us make here three tabernacles. We want to preserve this spiritual experience. We don't want to move from this experience to anything else. We want to remain here. We want to camp out, if you will, on this particular, in this particular experience. And so the first thing you learn from the Apostle Peter is do not camp out on spiritual experiences because God's intention is to develop growth in us. I've heard people give testimony of how the Lord met them in a certain place, and there are times when we have set up what we would call stones of remembrance. When the children of Israel were crossing into the promised land, they were to put up stones of remembrance so that in the future, when the Jewish children would see these stones that were placed there by the tribes, they could ask their father, what do these things mean? And then the father could rehearse to the children, this is how God moved and this is how God gave us this land. And in our, our lives, of course, we have what are called stones of remembrance. There are places where the Lord met you in a very special way, whether it was when you first got saved and you were in a Bible study and God gave you a, a nugget of truth that you've built your life around, whether it was a prayer that you had and said, God, please, would you help me with this? And, and God broke through and gave you some, some supernatural revelation of some sort where your prayer was answered and depth occurred. I mean, we all have stones of remembrance. When you leave, if you haven't gone to the northern wing here in our foyer and you look at our timeline, you can see that there are actual stones of remembrance in the form of pictures where you're looking at them. And, and I walked uh, some of the young ladies in our church just the other day. We were walking through and I was walking through and, and they happened to be there and I stopped and they, they said, oh, we hadn't even noticed if we never come in this direction. And I said, yeah, let me walk you through. And I started walking them through that timeline. And I said, you see that woman there teaching Sunday school? And there's this young woman speaking, teaching at Sunday school. They said, yeah, that's my wife, Marie. I see that little boy there closest to the camera there and that little girl next to him. Yeah, that's my son, David. And that's his cousin, Charity. I said, see that hippie guy with the curly hair? That's me. When I used, and so I walked her through. Those are called stones of remembrance. And you walk through, and I walked them through. I said, that's our first church building that we rented. There's the first house that we met in for Bible study. That's the school we used to meet in. And, and I walked them through. Those are and that's okay, but don't camp out there. Don't camp out there. We cannot always say the good old days because the best is yet to come. God wants to do more, abundantly more, than we could ask or think. But if we think that God has already passed by, that the cloud of glory has already moved on, it hasn't. God wants to continue doing worse. That's why I keep on praying that God will raise up the youth and, and move them forward until Jesus returns. Because for such a time as this, some of you are being raised up. You just don't know it yet. You think that these days are worse. And we had bad days when I was growing up. Yeah, that's true. We had race riots in Newark, Detroit, Chicago, Watts. We had some tough times. We had assassinations. We had John F. Kennedy killed, Robert F. Kennedy killed, Martin Luther King Jr. killed. We had people killed in Kent State by, by, by uh, uh, military personnel. We had the Vietnam War. We had an invasion of music and philosophy that, that just changed the entire society that we lived in. 
We went through one thing after another after another so that finally Time Magazine actually had an article that said, Is God dead? And a few years later it said, The Jesus Revolution. See, God isn't sto he hasn't stopped moving. God wants to continue moving. And I'd like to say to you young people, you younger people, listen, what does God want to do in you? Don't camp out on the past, but look to the future and see what God will do. Because I started this church as a home Bible study with a handful of people, and I am no different than you. God wants to use you. Amen? God wants to use you to do works for Jesus Christ. Don't forget it. There's nothing, nothing unique about me or any of the guys that you may know. Nothing unique other than one thing. We heard God say, move, and we did. And we do not camp out on the past. My pastor Chuck taught us, he says, I, um, I tip my hat to the past, but I take my jacket off for the future. And that's what the Lord has called us to do. And so one, do not camp out on past spirit, spiritual experiences. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. God wants to move you and move you and move you on into deepness. Secondly, learn to do God's will and not your own. Because Peter is still trying to substitute his plan for God's plans. Jesus, he says, allow us to build three shelters so you can remain here and you will not have to die. He's missing the point. Moses and Elijah must leave so that Jesus remains preeminent. And then third, I already mentioned this, but I'll say it again. Think before you speak. Sometimes the mouth is in gear before the brain kicks in. And you will say things, I've said things, God knows I've said a lot worse things than you have. God knows that. You know, James says a man offends with the tongue. It's a little, it's a little member but it can set off a great fire. And there's no doubt about it. There have been things that you've said and I have said that you didn't intend to say it that way and it came out that way. Maybe I'm the only one. And, and it, you've hurt somebody's feelings. You've hurt, and you didn't mean to. You were trying to comfort them. You were trying to say something to them that would encourage them. You just didn't do it right. I've done that so many times. So many times. Learn to think before you speak. Learn to listen. Marie has a miscarriage. See, Marie had, my wife Marie had five pregnancies in six years. And she had a miscarriage. And there are those who would say, don't worry about it. God will give you another child. That isn't the right thing to say when someone's mourning the loss of that child. It's kind of like when, when Job, I've heard this said, Job had his children all die at the beginning of the book of Job. All of his kids at one time. And then at the end, the Lord gives him children. And I've heard people say, see, he, he replaced. No, no, you never replace a lost child. You never replace a lost child, never. That child is always going to be your lost child. Now that doesn't mean that you don't take comfort in knowing that that baby's with Jesus. That doesn't mean that at all. But that does not remove the pain of the loss of that child. It never does. So we need to learn that sometimes the best thing we can do is listen and weep with those who weep and not be so quick to be Facebook police. You know what I'm saying. Somebody says, I'm feeling down, and before you know it, you've got 15 posts telling you why you shouldn't feel down. Listen, if I can't tell you I'm not feeling good today, who can I tell besides Jesus? I should tell him first and not tell you, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but sometimes the best thing you can do is simply say praying for you. Sometimes it's the best thing, praying for you. Don't understand, praying for you. And that's the kind of person that I gravitate to because they're not trying to advise me. They're trying to suffer with me. Weep with those who weep, Paul said to the Romans, right? So we need to learn 
sometimes that silence is golden. And sometimes it's the best thing. There's a psalm, Psalm 141, verse 3, that says this, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Proverbs 21, 23, He who guards his mouth and his tongue keeps himself from calamity. And that's true. So you learn these things from the Apostle Peter, who's so moved by the experience that he begins to blurt things out that really circumvent the will of God. Well, it says in verse 5, while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a, a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Now Luke tells us in chapter 9, verse 34, that they feared as they entered into the cloud. This cloud, we know, represents the, the glory of God. It's been referred to as the Shekinah glory of God. I used to think it was Chicano glory. No, it's Shekinah <laughs> glory. And it says that the voice came out of the cloud, this is my beloved son, notice, in whom I'm well pleased. I'm well pleased. So God is declaring his approval of everything Jesus has done and everything that Jesus has said. But notice also, he says, hear him. Now, when he says, hear him, that's another way of saying, obey him. Hear him is another way of saying, not just listen to what he's saying, but do what he says. I've said this to you before, I'll say it again. The Hebrews and the Greeks, the Jew and the Gentile. The Gentile believed that the accumulation of information, the accumulation of information was education. So the more I knew, the more educated I was. The Jews would say it's not just the accumulation of information, it's the accumulation of information that produces transformation. The Jew would say you don't really know something until you do it. And I, uh, well, obviously we're Christians, that's what he's teaching us. It's not that I can repeat Bible verses. It's that I'm learning those Bible verses by obeying them. So, so the Lord is saying, this is my beloved son. I'm very pleased. Hear him. He's saying, listen to what he says and do what he commands. If there is anything the church needs to remember today or perhaps even be taught, because this isn't the only church. I mean, there's thousands and thousands of churches throughout the United States and into the world. If the church in general needs to learn anything right now, it has to learn to obey what the Lord says. Because we have quite a number who profess the Lord with their lips, but haven't enshrined him in their hearts. They're able to talk about things, but they're not walking those things. And so what the Lord is saying here is more than just listen to what he's saying. I'm well pleased with him. Everything he's done and everything he said, I am well pleased with. But you need, he's saying, you need to hear him. You need to obey him. Jesus in John 14, verse 15, said it like this. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. In 1 John 5, 3, it says, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. They say, oh, it's so hard to follow Jesus. Well, John says, uh-uh, his commandments are not grievous. His commandments are not burdensome. His commandments are light. Because when God says, do this or don't do that, that it, it gives me a great comfort to know that my Father knows exactly what it is that I need. And he's saying, this is the answer to your prayer. You've been asking about this. Here's your answer. How many times I've spoken to young women who say, I want to date this guy who doesn't know Jesus, but I can lead him to Christ. So they become missionaries, missionary dating. No, it's easier for you to pull me off this platform than for me to pull you onto it. You know, no, no, what, is, what, is, what in common does light have with darkness? What in common does sweet have with bitter? What do I see in an unbeliever that is more attractive? than what I see in a person who loves Christ. And that reveals where my heart really is. Because if I'm attracted to sinfulness, I'm revealing my own sinful nature. 
but pastor, you don't know what a hunky is. <laughs> well, you know that guy's big old chest? It's going to become his belly. <laughs> I've been around a long time. I've seen those chests turn into bellies. I tell you this all the time. I'll say, it's stupid. I, all of you have heard this. Some of you haven't. That's why I say it. You know, the girls are getting those little stamps, those little tattoos on their back. They put the little honey, hummingbird, the little hummingbird on their back. It's going to turn into a vulture. <laughs> and they're walking it. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> so we need to be careful. You know, the word of the Lord is very pure. And the word of the Lord directs our footsteps. We need to understand it. The power of the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to perform that which our heart desires, but our flesh doesn't allow. Keep that in mind. And so we need to understand that his commandments are not grievous, they're not burdensome, and the Lord would have us to do what he says, obey him. How do we know his word? How would he know what he's telling us? Read your Bibles, read them daily, and ask God, give me insight, and I will do those things that you're teaching me. So as this is taking place, we'll roll up to the conclusion, verse 6, where he goes, his disciples heard it. They fell on their faces, were greatly afraid. Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, don't be afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Now, as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. His disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Jesus answered and said to them, Elijah truly is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already, and they didn't know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. And so in verses 6 through 8, they were afraid, their faces were touching the ground and all. That's the most natural reaction. When you encounter something that is powerful and pure like that, you are immediately made aware of your own sinfulness. That's what happens. You don't puff yourself up and think, oh, look at how wonderful I am that God is showing me. No, it humbles you. It's the exact opposite of what takes place. Sometimes you'll see people who say, oh, I speak to the Lord and God speaks to me every day and this and that. Listen, if, if the Lord ministers in a way like this, the natural reaction is going to be on your face before the Lord, and it takes Jesus to come and comfort you, and that's what he does. Now, as this is taking place, and he says to them, not to tell anybody, verse 9 tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. When you add Mark's insight, it helps you, because in Mark chapter 9, verses 9 and 10, it said, as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen till the Son of Man were risen from the dead, and they kept that saying with themselves, questioning one with another what the rising from the dead should mean. They still didn't understand. And so they were still discussing amongst themselves, what does he mean? But they went into that question. Well, what about the scribe saying that Elijah must come first? You see, Malachi prophesied that in Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, where it says, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the land with a curse. So Jesus acknowledges that Elijah literally comes in the future, but he says one already has come in the role of Elijah. And he had mentioned that earlier, and you see that in verse 13 when it says, then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. Because Jesus had already made reference to that in Matthew chapter 11, verses 11 through 14. The Son of Man is about to suffer at their hands. They rejected John and he died. Even so, they will reject Jesus, and they will kill him also. And they understood, to a degree, a little bit more, when they began to put the pieces together. May the Lord help us to hear him. Listen, not a single one of us in this room has a better plan for our life than God has for it. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. If, I, if I'd have gone through with the plans for my own life, 
that I had for myself, I'd be retiring from driving a truck in San Luis Obispo because that was the plan for my life. I wanted to move to San Luis Obispo, drive a bread truck, raise a family, and retire someday. God's plans were better than mine. And God's plans for you are better than the ones you've planned for yourself. The best thing you can learn, remain in the center of his will and watch what God will do. And one day you'll turn around and you'll see all the wonderful things that Jesus did in your life. And you'll go, oh God, your plans were so much better than mine. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your word. And thank you that you're coming again. I will be prepared so that when you come, I want to hear those words, well done, my faithful, faithful servant.